of the Bauer Symposium. Um, today, Achus will represent the architecture master track. And as you can see, um, also tomorrow and the day after, there will be more lectures and workshops. Um, so be sure to check them out. And for today, we invited Helma Rams and um, Kees Fritschi, who are two recent graduates from our faculty and have just opened up their own office. And they will tell us what it's like as young graduates um, to start your own office. So welcome, Helma and Kees. Thank you very much. So, you can see, you see the screen. Fantastic. Change. So, hi. Hi, all. Thank you. Thank you very much for having us. So, uh, quite excited to have the, the, the lecture. Um, we, we, as you, as Maria just said, we started off uh, not too long ago. So, we thought there's not much we can teach, but we thought that for everybody who is looking forward to start on their own after the, after, after the studies, we could offer a glimpse of uh, how it is, so to say, through some anecdotes and uh, say, and wins and failures that, uh, that we, we want to portray through by like, describing our um, our project. And so for that, we could just not present the three projects that we've been working on so far. So uh, I will tell a bit about how it all started. Um, about uh, in September 2019, um, while I was still graduating, I was halfway in the process of my graduation. I um, got uh, someone within my network who wanted to build a house. And um, to me, for me, it was a bit too much to start a project on my own because I knew I also had my graduation. But it was also an opportunity that was too good to let go. So um, that was the moment when I asked Helmer, uh, Hey, we, do you want to do it uh, together with me? And that's basically uh, how we started. And uh, yeah, on that project, uh, we went to move on to more projects. <laughs> so, um, yeah, here, um, here you see us at uh, our first clients. So, there was actually, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there was. Yeah, quite hard in the beginning because in uni you're 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 your own client and you, know, you design uh, within your own taste and your own fascinations. But for our first project, we had not one client, but uh, actually two clients, two couples. So actually not two, but four clients. <laughs> so, and these two clients um, wanted to build one building uh, together. And they had a similar budget, but actually quite different um, wishes. So one family didn't like the old house, and they were really wanted to build their new dream house. And for the other couple, it was more of a new start. They had quite a big house, and they needed a new place, and it could be a bit smaller for them. So it was a challenge right from the start. So here you see uh, see the site. Uh, one of the clients uh, bought this house with uh, a very uh, narrow piece of land with it, um, and he had the idea to build uh, one house there for himself, and then all the way uh, on the other side of the plot uh, another house. And then when he went to the municipality, they they told him like it's not possible. You you need to make you can only build within the footprint. Um, Current house at the beginning of the plot, so that changed everything for him. And he had to look for um, yeah, another uh, another person that wanted to do this house together with him. So yeah, and then for us the challenge to demolish this house you see here and um, yeah, build a new house right there. Okay, so you can see uh, you can see where the problems are because you. Uh, you have these two couples that uh, moved, um, yeah, they want to make a project out of necessity and uh, yeah, project it together. So, and they kind of chose these two very young architects uh, to realize the biggest investment of their lives. So, it's now came the at least the typological problem of the cement attached house, which is that they can't be any losers. It was very, we had to resist the temptation to do a volume. That kind of um, that uh, that separated two volumes out of each other, and just make one simple gesture that they 
uh, we wanted to get at least a feeling that the, for all the clients, that the client inhabited the whole building in just one, not just one half of it. Just, uh, just politically, it was a very, 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 say, a narrow path to walk in order to convince the clients that there would be no losers. So we're looking for a structure that combined, um, that way, a structure that basically had a general idea, but also was able to accommodate uh, asymmetries to uh, accommodate the different wishes. So um, we we started off. This is literally the first models we ever made, and these photos are taken in the second floor of the TOW. Um, just saying. So um, hence the lighting. Apologies, but um, we created some options. Um, when you, I mean, when you don't work with our non-architects, uh, they and an investment like this, they need. You need to give them a specific type of control over the design process in order to feel not only trusted but also feel really confident with their own choices. However, they cannot choose everything. So we gave them this scope of options that embody the principles that we said, which is basically the volume with no losers, so to say. Um, but and by showing them options, not only we gave them at least the reality and the illusion of choices, but also let's say. We provoked some strong reactions that uh, made our, the reading of our clients a bit easier. When you hear now on the lower left, it would be a power, uh, yeah, uh, would be kind of some interlocking and uh, interlocking room order that uh, one of the clients did not want because all the children of the other client would walk over their, her napping head and she did not want that. So it's basically through provocation, you can get a lot of the reactions that you want in order to get to know your clients. So we basically decided to design uh, one skin to give uh, the building a clear appearance. And also because they have similar budgets, you could not do one side that is very different from the other. But then in the inside, make it very personal. So that's the section shows that very nicely that you can see that the inside really where um, the differences are. Uh, also, light was a big issue. Uh, how do you work with a building where uh, they don't have the same uh, light qualities? And with feeders and uh, roof windows, we allowed to get nice light from all sides in both of the houses, which you can see here in the section. Um, um, in the floor plan, um, you see uh, also the different wishes of the client uh, coming together with one more open side and one um, floor plan that's more um, consisting of uh, closed spaces, uh, which was something the client made very clear uh, from the beginning that the one couple was looking for that and the other one was uh, looking for a different infill, which was nice for us to, to learn how to um, yeah, work with these uh, differences. And I would like to say something about um, how we uh, designed it, because uh, after six months, we um, transitioned to, uh, to BIM, uh, something we both didn't like in our studies. <laughs> yeah, it was terrible. Yeah, it was terrible for studying, but uh, we found out that um, to do a project and we are actually going to build it at quite some uh, expenses. Just to reinforce things, but we're very happy to, to be able to do that. It's just saving us a lot of time, but it uh, takes out some creativity at some point. Um, here you see some renders that we used uh, in the process with the client because. In the first meetings, we discovered that the client was not so great at, at reading the floor plans. And in studies, you present the floor plan to a teacher and then they understand uh, what that means spatially. But, um, the clients, it's very hard for them to understand what it means when Peter uh, is reading this uh, double height spaces. So this, this render, what you see here, it's, it's not a finished render, but it was a render we used to talk about and give the client insight in what it actually meant to have the floor plan like that. And this helped a bit for me uh, because at the beginning we printed the plans in one to two hundred and they were like 
this is it. And then we printed it one to 50, which is filled in whole A3s, like, oh, wow, quite a big house. So we had to add the scale in some way. And so uh, th this helped. And this helped. In the next render, you see uh, the, uh, a render from the exact same position uh, on the other side of the house. So it was also fun for the clients to see the differences and to know like, okay, what the other couple has is also a possibility for us, but we choose this. And that was for both of them, I think, really nice to, to, to have this process and uh, get confidence in continuing and designing it. We also, the window, however. Yeah, we also <laughs> snuck in a little capriccio of ours, which is a ridiculous window, the one you see on the right. It starts at 40 centimeters and it ends at 155. So it just say wrongly placed, but the whole idea was that uh, was to have a window to look out when you sit from, to know to be, especially this room was all about intimacy. I think we know that they all would have only noticed when it was already built, and that was too late, and we were quite charmed by that. But uh, the rack of would have been quite, uh, yeah, quite something. Um, yeah, at the end, this is how it ended, uh, this is how it ended up. Um, I think we, we managed to, say, navigate the political lines of trying to create one urban gesture that allowed for, that allowed for individuality, but also, uh, but also attaching to the training of the neighborhood. This is also that with the bell stand, which uh, for you who don't know, when you have ones who don't know, when you present, when you want to make a, a new building, you have to present it to a local council that they and they choose on the basis of beauty if they like it or not. So you have to be very, very um, uh, say good at selling because they're going to come up with some bullshit at you and basically giving um, starting starting story from the one the graining, but it's also the how that we. And that helps quite a lot. Uh, so these people, the well ones, you need to really uh, explain them the process for them to understand why uh, you want to build it that way. And involve them. Involve them because what they suggested to us was a completely different building. I mean, just uh, yeah, follow them. It would never look like this. <laughs> yeah, and also what I just wanted to finish off with this one is that uh, we wanted our clients to say. I live in the house with the two groups and not be like, I live in the White House, but only the right side, the left one is a bit shit. So that's, I think we managed to at least get uh, it so far. Yeah. Um, we made a lot of models uh, as a process. That con they contain much more information than a plan, and they, it, they help in a, to an enormous degree. To actually, yeah, to, to actually make yourself and your client sure that what you're doing is uh, is good. They create this object of desire that uh, has the capability to be loved. It's a plan, it's an abstraction, but this starts this place with your imagination. So we make uh, small models, but um, also bigger models, just to be really sure. And, uh, and um, yeah. Basically, going the extra mile for a client by making it a tape and uh, putting a chair to see if you would sit nicely on the toilet and all of that uh, allowed us to create the immersive experience that gave us the enthusiasm to carry on to the client and say, like, what we're doing is tricky, but it works because we have been there. And it was good for the client to see this, but it was also very helpful for ourselves because sometimes mm -hmm. we were not so sure if the space we were designing was actually working that well. Making it with tape and just uh, walking in it, that it was a way for us to, to get confidence and continue in that way. No. At the end, yeah, yesterday we were thinking, what should we say with the slides? It's just we put it in because we like it, but everything is already said. It's uh, quite proud. So um, we worked for about a year on this project and we were. About to get our uh, papers for cleaning, which allows you to start building. Building permit. Building permit. And what happened then was very sad. One of the clients uh, got corona and he ended up on the intensive care. He was there for, uh, for one month and he almost died a couple of times. And um, yeah, we are very happy that, that he survived. But yeah, putting all his savings in a building project. Was not something that was on the agenda anymore. 
So yeah, that was very sad end uh, of the project. But uh, yeah, we learned a lot of things of the process and we had not much time to be sad because in the week that uh, they called us, okay, we're very sorry that we cannot continue. We got a new project. <laughs> I'm not sure if you see the if you see the yeah, uh, changed. Oh, changed. Okay, so uh, I will explain about uh, the new project with us, what we did. Um, the new project uh, we got as a spin-off uh, my graduation project. For my graduation project, I investigated a building that worked very closely together with nature and food production. And I had, uh, I invited a lot of people uh, in my audience. It was, I was lucky it was before Corona happened. So uh, I could still do it at the faculty with a big audience. And I was very lucky that one of the uh, people in the audience uh, knew someone who was doing a very similar project. So they brought us into contact with them and we um, showed them my graduation project. And we said, like, okay, uh, we investigated. Uh, all these subjects for about a year, and we know quite a lot about it. And uh, yeah, that was a very good match. So then we got to uh, design uh, a kitchen for, uh, for a very special chef. We will explain more about later. And the chef is uh, bringing uh, the kitchen uh, to the ingredients. So it's actually the other way around. He doesn't bring the ingredients to the kitchen, but the kitchen to the ingredients where you have um, all these um, ingredients now traveling uh, all around the world to end up on your plate. Um, this chef takes his ingredients fresh from the farmers and like the shortest transportation chain possible and um, prepares them there and then brings them to their clients, which is uh, quite a new way of working and also something he wants to share with other people. So it's not just a kitchen, it's also a place where he invites people and shows, shows what he's doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, what I want, what's important about this is that this client really has a philosophy uh, of his own and has a lot of character. So the building should um, represent him in the best way possible. <laughs> And the location he chose for the building is this uh, orchard. It's uh, located in the, uh, the Highland Meer, close to Amsterdam. Um, on this uh, terrain, it's, it's, yeah, it's like a very big uh, estate, Dutch landgoed. Um, a lot of recreation is happening here. People come here in the weekends to do uh, self-harvesting. They have all these fruit trees. And um, yeah, so they walk around and yeah, they will also see this new building on us. So, also, it's a good opportunity to make something that will be visible to, to a lot of people. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. as as Kay said, it was something a bit more than a production kitchen. We basically had the task of uh, it was the first project that uh, did not have a specific program uh, that we had to develop it really around the planning, so to say. It was the approach very different. As we had to embody the values of a modern business while still maintaining uh, architecture that grew out of the landscape in the same way that the food that was going to be cooked here uh, would. So it was um, it, the, the relationship between the container and the object was uh, something to keep in mind over, uh, over time. Um, thus, the light motif, or so the guiding principle of the materials, was the same as of the food. Seasonal, local, and uh, yeah, from around. And we first had to look at what's there. So, as a first step, wood and uh, shingles and, uh, and all of that was, kind of, I think, the, the logical choice. Um, so, to start the process of designing, uh, first we had to learn a lot because the production kitchen is not something you design every day. So, we had to understand what. We had to design and we had to understand all the processes uh, that happened in this building. So, for example, it started with a place where you uh, clean the vegetables, then it moves on to a 
table where they cut them. And from there, they go back to a fridge. And from this fridge, they go to uh, the kitchen where um, vegetables get prepared. And from there, back to storage. And then, so yeah, so this whole chain uh, basically um, depicts how the building um, should be. So we spent a couple of weeks in understanding this whole process and analyzing uh, other production kitchens to be able to make a building that actually functions well. And we used the uh, flow diagram to uh, get a get a understand these processes, but also be able to add other processes to the processes the client suggested. So for example, uh, a biodigester is a machine that turns organic waste into, into energy. And that way we can use the uh, processes um, that are proposed by the client to do something more than, uh, than just that process itself. So it all starts, starts working together in terms of the production, the energy, uh, climate of the building, and make it one whole and try to find processes that uh, would benefit the other things that also happen there and yeah Plus, optimize yeah optimize a lot yeah, if you show this to the clients even if you don't understand it uh looks like like you know what you're doing so even if you bake it you can make it <laughs> to put it in a very simple way uh, we uh we also i mean the ambitions were big and the budget was small as uh, always um but the, eventually the, the building ought to be off the grid so that was the ambition of the client whether you it's a good or a bad idea. But we, we thought, because we had to decide for a future that wasn't certain, we had to at least give a roadmap that would implement, um, that would, that would make the ambitions realistic. Basically, stay, starting with the basics and conceiving all the installations as a as add-ons that you can upgrade and recycle instead of doing just a total design, uh, in order to be involved with, uh, with time. Because that not only meant that you could improve on the, on the installations, or everything, but also adapt it or expand it or scale it with the future use. So this was, uh, it, um, this is, these are not form generating thoughts, but they are extremely important for when you actually create shape to have in mind, for instance, how much insulation room are you gonna have? Because that always backs your ass. No. Uh, now we're just going to walk through a process because that was a hell of a ride. Uh, it's uh, yeah, this is not what you saw at the beginning. It's uh, the beginning is a bit later, but this is how it started. Um, sort of landscape, organic shape. It's the at least we were also quite torn by the fact that we had never done anything with curves. So thought this is our chance, since also our client had a bit of a speech with curves thing. That and it's true that they are placed in the right way. We can use they invite the eye to explore. And, uh, and there's also invite the, the person to come. They're kind of a very, very inviting, uh, yeah, very inviting entity. Um, plus, if you combine it with, say, norm, more normal shapes, you can have a quite good hybrid of the rationality of the kitchen with the inviting quality of the curve. And uh, these, I mean, these were just uh, rough ideas. I think there's a small, a small delay with our slides. Uh, it's a couple small, uh, small ideas. At some point, however, yeah, yeah. oh yeah, that's great. Well, at some point, however, we got a budget slap, like a proper, and uh, that that forced us to rethink, to basically filter out the clutter of all the ideas that we had, clean up, and focus on the things that matter for this design, which were material space and transparency material for the concept space for the use and transparency for the landscape that would and everything from there has to have to uh serve those three principles so we have opted for a more cost efficient uh design that uh, uh, that relied on regularity symmetry speed of production this by the way also helped us to research uh prefab uh, the whole change in budget it forced us to look much more in detail on the on uh, yeah on everything we were using. So now actually calling with the manufacturers, calling with experts and, uh, and others, that uh, we can only really 
uh, recommend also while we were studying. I'm quite, I'm quite uh, ashamed, not ashamed, but I'm a, a bit of a yarn that we, that we did not do a study. But there's a lot to be learned, and there's a lot of free advice you can get, surprisingly. Um, and yeah, at some point we ended up with that mildly monumental uh, building that represents um, a evolutive take on the traditional farm typology. Because, uh, you know, on farms, usually have this, uh, this large roof over uh, yeah, cantilever that uh, are supposed to not only protect the facade, but create a dry place to store your tools and wood. And uh, if you, there's, there's some functionalities that have a lot of historical validity that we embodied, uh, that we embodied in, this, uh, in, this, uh, in this design. Um, but it's, the design is quite simple. You have three closed volumes that represent the services. And the space in between is transparent, open, where the kitchen happens. Because the, the, the client is going to use uh, tables on wheels to see how they see how they move it around. But the uh, light again. In the floor plan, the way the vegetables travel in the building, that was always leading to make yeah. the floor plan. Um, so we use some models um, to investigate the way to build it. So what you see here are uh, parts of the section, um, parts of the section in 3D, uh, which we did to, to build it ourselves, the structure from wood. And from there, I get an idea what was, uh, what was smart to do and what was not smart, because we knew the floor plan and the basic principles to, uh, to go on to the next step and present it to uh, wood experts. This really helped to, us to get a better understanding of how it would work, and uh, yeah, it would save us mistakes in a later stage, which, which would be much more expensive. <laughs> Find out then. Which is also a way of selling a model to a client, because models are necessary, but also quite expensive. But if you say the client that this is the way we have to bring the construction site to the office in order to avoid mistakes in the future, they will gladly pay for that. So that's, uh, that's uh, yeah, what kind of way of uh, making our capricious be paid for. Um, to save costs, we did not just uh, look at optimizing the shape and uh, the shape of the building and the plan. We also tried to find different materials. And at some point, we uh, proposed this material to the client, which you see here is polycarbonate. And uh, for paper, it was quite cool because uh, if the building would be uh, Functioning and it would get dark, like the whole kitchen would uh, glow up a bit. <laughs> and it would be like a very attractive uh, building in the landscape. But um, this material didn't fit to the philosophy of the client at all. So that's also something we learned that, um, yeah, working within a story, um, you find out what you can do and what you cannot do. So this design ended up very uh, quickly in the bin. <laughs> And um, so the last design you saw with the, with the um, rectangular uh, floor plan was something where everything came together for us at least. Because, uh, we were in the budget, we used all the principles we wanted, but we could see that the client was not so happy with it. For them, it felt like a very ordinary building and they really missed the curves we were talking about in the beginning. So that's also a way a project can go. So we had to get back to the drawing table and actually make again a new design in which we were bringing back the curves and this time um, do it in a way that would be a bit more smart. So in terms of um, making a building with curves, that allows us to build it with the budget. So what we did is we took the functional uh, part of the building, which is the square, it's very efficient, and then use the curves just for the uh, space around it, but also efficient shape and surface. Mm. Oh, that. On uh, to, to our last project, which is probably the one that we're having uh, quite fun uh, with at the moment. Again, a slightly manly monumental. And what is special about this one? It's a uh, 
It's a small vacation home, but it was not built, uh, it did not have a specific program, but it was too small. It was not built around the client, but because of its location, it's a, it's a building that we just completely began from the material. We just look, first look at what's there and, uh, and uh, the whole material language of the island. Um, where is the project? Uh, the project yeah, is in an undisclosed uh, Spanish island where people go to party. Um, or I can say, I'll, I'll probably say later. But it is located in one of the more beautiful parts of that party island. Um, but it's so beautiful that it is protected and it's subject to zoning rules. Uh, since I think two years or so, the government flies around with drones uh, to check also with software if something has been renovated illegally or has changed. So, however, getting something done there is very difficult to be properly protected. So we have to stay within the existing footprint, the footprint of the existing shed, which at the moment is just there to store the uh, wood in the uh, agricultural, um, agricultural terrain. Um, yeah, so bit more clear uh, the footprint of the building that's where we can build because the island doesn't want to have more buildings so the floor plan you see here that's basically uh, the old footprint then with the new program so it's just a bedroom with a small kitchen where you can prepare a drink drink it maybe in the sun and a small uh, bathroom so uh, this place can function as a little guest house Next to the main building where, um, where the host would stay. Um, and, uh, to start, we started this project um, with the idea to look at local materials because we thought it's such a beautiful uh, location. We need to make something that really gets um, the spirit of this place. And looking at local materials, you can build something that actually. Um, feels like it's supposed to be there. So yeah, that's also something we discovered we um, did in the other project and worked quite well. Um, and speaking of um, the environmental benefits of that, something we would like to continue in uh, future projects as well. Yeah. And the original, it's important to say that the client, this is the place where the client grew up. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, deeply embedded in that family's uh, understanding of landscape and memory. So since it's a vacation home, it was very important that we embed the memory of the place by using regional materials in order to feel like a proper, like a proper home. Um, and uh, Orana Island, which uh, is Mallorca, by the way, for the ones who did not find out yet. Um, the resource map is rather limited. There's, most of the historical buildings uh, just are carried, the stone carries. All the openings are filled up in wood. And then the iron is used to open doors and uh, do, make things move. But that is it. That is, and there's some ceramics to cover a couple of things. There's really not much more. And that sensitivity to nuances was pretty important to make a, to make a small yeah, a small intervention like that truly meaningful to be a success as a, yeah, as a vacation home. So to get to this information that Helm was talking about, we organized some study trips on the island. We talked with local architects told us about the drones and all these kind of things we had to learn. So the only way to find out is actually go there and meet the people that have the information. And we met the constructor, we asked him about, um, this is what we want to do, do you, do you have tips? So reaching out to all these people helped us to, to get the information uh, we needed. <laughs> and, and we find out that um, these people do not really like to look much about at plants. So here you, you see me looking at the plant, but actually we were standing uh, on the side pointing at the building most of the time. And like, like what, what can we do here? What is a good solution here? So we so, spent so much time in making like really one to ten drawings, like perfectly measures and materials. Like, so we thought about that. And then we just comes like, oh, no, yes. Uh, which tells you about, about the building culture there. And, uh, 
uh, the role of the architect needs to, needs to play. Um, also important so because of the logistics, uh, which are a bit more com too complicated for the lecture, despite being so small, uh, we had to plan for the building to be built by one person, one single. Uh, we could not choose it. There was like this one person that the client knew that was gonna that was gonna do it. So uh, the whole piece that we embarked on with research, the buying books and all of that, that uh, would render us low tech solutions that were validated by more than uh, 200 years of history, so to say, and uh, involved in how do you use the porous stone to stack it in a proper way. How can you even transport it and put it up as one person? Um, uh, all of that. But despite nobody looking at it but us, it, the detailing really helped us uh, write the right, uh, ask the right question about if it's actually Google and if it's uh, Google. So, this, um, despite looking quite finished, it is, uh, what you see is more of, a, of an actual research uh, research drive. Um, and when you design around the material, you have to go through the material literally. So, we went to the quarry. And let's uh, see if uh, we could carry the stones we promised uh, that would be carryable by one man. We could with the two of us. And um, we were, uh, this is, I mean, we went, we went to build a mock up as well. So we bought some stones. And when we were trying to get the stones from the palais into the car, uh, yeah, we, Case and I, which is coming straight from the airport with our shirts and our uh, gloves, and we can start carrying the, the rather thin stone. We could, but it was not very graceful. At some point, the guy who was doing that was so small he could fit standing in the trunk of my car. Yeah, just said, amigos, get out of the way. And he just like grabbed it and put it in for us. It was like, okay, so it's buildable by one man, but you need to put that man. Uh, and we were put to shame and in front of the client, which uh, did not have a lot. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, yeah, so the bit important. When you talk about sustainability and uh, and uh, and locality, it's not only about the materials, but also if you read the materials book by the Ruby Press, uh, they have a chapter when they talk about how sustainability is also uh, needs to be social in a way that if you use techniques that require local knowledge and foment that, you can not only maintain local traditions going, but you allow. Uh, locals to be able to the repairs themselves um, by sort of basically maintaining uh, like using the building as a cultural act so on the left you see the stones that we uh, could not carry on the right the, the carpenter that uh, what are the type of um, traditional windows that we are gonna fix in the, in the building um, which will be done by a carpenter that's uh, 200 meters away and it's, it's, it's just, uh, and also works almost without time to tell him that it's my problem, he doesn't know. And he, um, and he, he makes the he makes window for that for him. Yeah, so basically, ordering the stuff from him means that if something breaks down, he, he is around to repair it. So, to give our building the longest life as possible, but it's very yeah. sustainable way of designing the region. Uh, yeah, because everything has been very traditional and very and very stony and uh, yeah and low tech and all of that. Um, but we, it is important that you don't make that you don't get yourself lost in formalities. You don't need to follow. You need to. We thought we needed to include playful elements that uh, make the building good even in the bad days. Um, so we visited this uh, Huguet Mallorca, which is uh, quite a famous terrazzo maker. That um, yeah, what a famous certain that's that uh, that is that is known for its experiments in colorful uh, things. Yeah. So yeah, we visited these factories and, and explained us about the process. And uh, now we are about to design our own pattern that will be the door of the small house. Yeah, this is this is yeah, the bathroom. It's going to be nice. Uh, so to really understand how we need to use this material, the Mares stone, that is basically the most important part of the project, we uh, did a lot of study trips. So we had our questions prepared uh, and we visited all these different buildings to see how they uh, exactly used the product we were looking at. So 
And what we find out is that the porosity of the stone um, has a big influence on how the building is aging. So you see in the, in the building on the left that the, 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 the texture gets much more rough over time. And on the building on the right, it's, it's more uh, smooth. So that was a big lesson for us to actually be able to make a choice in which stone we want. Because it's important to say that in the same cubic meter, you can get the both type of stones. It's a very temperamental type of sandstone. Yeah. Yeah. And also the joints, uh, how yeah. the joints are made, are a big part of how the building will appear. So these study tips uh, are not just fun, but they really help us a lot to choose yeah. how, to, how we want to build it. Yeah. Well, actually, now that you mentioned study trips, it's normally you do you need to do study, study trips in the beginning, which are good for um, yeah, what they're fun as fuck, but they're also um, good for inspiration in a way and to put your mind in the right place. But this is the first time we did a study trip with a very specific set of questions, and you look at things in a completely different way. And if they can, uh, we can only really recommend it that at least halfway through the time, really go to if you can. Uh, to the place again, or to or, or go out to see properly, because you you just look very differently. You you don't uh, yeah you go to find and you don't go to discover, which is a uh, important. You know what you're looking for. Yeah. Um, here you see some samples uh, we discovered. Uh, uh, yeah, we actually we bought. We, when we were visiting these places, we tried to buy small samples and take them home to see how other materials would fit together and, and base our choices on that. Um, so yeah, and creating the right material language for, uh, for the building. And here you see us uh, building the, the little mock-up, uh, putting cement on the stones and put them in the right position. And as we did that, uh, we discovered that the stones need to be five centimeters uh, smaller because they're actually quite hard to carry. So those are things uh, which will give you a lot of insight and change your dimensions or uh, techniques. And after we did this, uh, yeah, it was perfect to go back to the drawings and like change all the things, uh, all the things we learned. Uh, yeah, so um, uh, here you see our finished mock up, and we, we leave it there for a couple of months to um, see what the weather uh, does to it. And then when we get back, we, um, yeah, we'll probably <laughs> learn new things as well. Yeah, we open by then. It's going to be nice. And, um, yeah, the, the construction of the project uh, will start in April, so, so we'll be quite excited about that. Um, since you wanted to finish uh, uh, by showing a photo of our new offices, which we moved in, uh, moved in recently, it's been quite a crazy year because we had to adopt changes every week. Like every week we had to do something different because we kept, kept constantly uh, over shorthanded or we're doing something. But uh, yeah, things are fun, especially uh, this lecture is a great point of pride that uh, uh, we're getting a lot of energy from that. So, so. Well, I want to add to the, yeah. the, the first project we were quite nervous because we discovered that a lot of things we didn't know. Then we sort of got an attitude where it was like, okay, a lot of things we don't know, but we can find out in the process. Yeah. And that's basically what we're doing now. And then, yeah, so, yeah, it works quite well <laughs> so far. That's, uh, that's it from our side. Thank you very much. Well, thank you guys. Um, there's already some questions. I will just start with the first one, which is actually two questions in one. Um, so I would like to know how you get in contact with your clients. Also, I'm interested which studios you did in the master. Okay, um, so I think when you've never built a building before, you cannot get a client based on your reputation. So all the clients we have are within our own network. So friends or friends or yeah. Just the first projects you need to be a bit lucky and uh, have people through your own network and 
we hope that once we have the project we're working on right now finished, then of course um, other people can see the buildings and projects will come from them. It does help, however, to have a platform uh, because at the beginning of the first project we did not uh, we did not have much yet. But at the moment we set up the office as an office, and Skype was still just being two tools for the laptop. Uh, but uh, that, that's I, you, you put an entity behind the names so that, that really say that really helps to, to be taken a bit more seriously. Exactly, and when, when you really say like we are doing this, we set yeah. up the office. Also, things will come to you. So if you're not at the office yet, the project will not come like right? this. Yeah. <laughs> also, on the studios, uh, I did uh, MSC1 uh, interior. Actually, that's where we met uh, doing MSC1 interiors. And then MSC2 white factory, very recommendable if uh, you want to slap in the face. But you, it's, I had the fun of my life uh, learning to program the world, no joke. And the uh, in interiors uh, for graduation. Um, I started, uh, like Emma said, with Master 1 Interiors. After that, I did uh, Master 2 uh, Heritage. And for my graduation, I was in the Architectural Engineering Institute. Okay. Would you also say that the MSC 1 that you did together influenced your work? Um, not much. It found, it found us each other, but uh, MSC 1, the thing is that our tutors were literally also, say, three years older than us. So it was uh, it, it was more of a it, it established. So it, it, I, don't, I don't know how to say it, but it, it established it a very yeah a very fertile ground. Because at some point, uh, I don't know, towards the end, uh, we were the only ones uh, say working together at, uh, at night. At some point, that, that I don't know if, uh, that definitely bonded a bit. Okay, perfect. So the next question, um, could you talk a little bit about your experience with the clients and if they treat you the same as they would treat an older, more experienced architect? <laughs> um, I think um, we were surprised that uh, clients uh, are actually sometimes looking for young architects. That's true. For example, the project of the front kitchen, the client really likes the fact we are young because in this opinion, uh, young people are fresh, they have uh, new ideas, so being young is really not uh, a disadvantage, it's also a benefit. There's definitely clients uh, looking for these, these young people because they, yeah. And also, it's, it's true because we really, like an architect that's maybe older and did, did many projects before, will not work that hard as, as we will because we really, we not, of course, we do it for the client. But, we also want to improve ourselves, so yeah, it's something a client feels as well. That we give everything to the project. But also, um, to also give another example, the Mallorca project was a bit of the opposite side. Um, we were forced, or well, we were in, in glad, let us say, invited by the client to come to Mallorca to speak to the contractor that was going to do it and to a friend of, uh, of the client, who was an uh, experienced architect, to present our design and get their opinion. So to say, um, and um, basically going through the whole process, defending the design, but also being open to uh, to really say good and necessary proposals, plus building the mock-up in the garden and seeing how it would end up shining. That uh, say that, uh, that these were kind of points of uh, were points where the client really said like, okay, these guys are serious, they work a lot, and they're going for it. But they they, they put they, they make small tests. Because at the end of it, you're still young and don't know anything. But uh, as Kay said earlier, we just we just say yes. Uh, and if when we say oh, we don't know, then but we know who to ask. So that's a perfectly valid uh, valid valid answer. But uh, you you will uh, you, you will never be taken as seriously as you want. So you uh, you work extra hard, which is good for everybody. Say like that. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, so the last question, I was wondering if you're already living from your office or if you are still working next to it, and how do you know when to make the transition? Um, I mean, we, we do some projects now and, and we get an income, but it's uh, still very insecure because you don't really know when the client is going to pay you. 
like pain and type can be a problem. So, or and, pain so. and uh, also, what's, what's, uh, what will happen after that project, project is finished? Do you, do you get a new project that can deliver two incomes? So, um, I do a little bit of uh, freelance work on the side as well, and uh, Amma also works. So, um, but yeah, of course, we have the ambition to go full time. Okay, well, thank you guys, and uh, good luck in the future with your office. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Hopefully, if anybody has more questions, just reach out to us. We're, uh, we're happy to help. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Bye bye. Okay, bye. bye.